a darling of fictional navies everywhere. The aircraft carrying submarine, the submarine aircraft carrier, if you will, was, in reality, one of the least efficient and effective uses of tonnage out there. Large and unwieldy, these were submarines that certainly suffered in the role as submarines in their attempt to gain the limited ability to carry and launch aircraft. While several different nations experimented in the concept, only Imperial Japan actually made a real go of it. Probably telling, really, that Japan is the only nation to really do it, because the Japanese in World War II were very fond of their inefficient and overly complex plans. As a concept as a whole, there were really three different uses for such a submarine. Two of which, again, largely focused in Japan, though one of them was at least tested in other navies. That being the scout role, carrying one or two seaplanes in a hangar on the submarine's deck for the purpose of scouting for targets and the like. This role is arguably the one where, at least in the Inner Warriors, carrying aircraft on a submarine makes some level of sense. In the days before radar and when sonar equipment was still in its infancy, having a plane able to take off and search for targets is somewhat useful, maybe. This is especially true in the Pacific with its vast distances. However, it's also a symptom of Japan's weird scouting doctrine wherein any ship that could carry a seaplane was expected to do the scouting, while the actual proper aircraft carriers only attacked. As Japan liked to use submarines as picket ships, it should not be surprising they would like them to carry planes to scout like this. Even in this limited role, though, you're still getting a much larger submarine than is strictly necessary. A submarine that has to carry all the spare parts and equipment, and fuel for that matter, for an aircraft, in addition to its own supplies. When it's just one scout, this isn't too big of a deal, though it does still inherently limit the submarine itself. The second role that Japan came up with for their aircraft carrying submarines, though, oh boy, that one's a doozy. I'm fairly sure that most people watching this video have at least heard of the I-400 class submarines, probably in some YouTube or old military or history channel documentary about the, and I quote here, Largest submarines of World War II, Japan's submersible superweapon. <clears throat> Certainly a favorite of early 2000s documentaries, the I-400s are interesting. Like, they're a fun topic to talk about. But at the same time, they're extremely inefficient. A triumph of technology for their time, to be sure, but arguably a waste of materials put into them. While I'm not going to go into huge detail on the ships here, yes, I'll do a proper video on them eventually, I'll at least go a bit into them, namely on the idea that there was intended to be 18 of them for coordinated attacks. I can completely believe, by the way, that this was Admiral Yamamoto's idea, because, well, look at Midway and such. Admiral Yamamoto is famous for nothing more than his love for overly complex and really quite insane plans. Now, getting into this, though, leaving aside for the moment that even if all 18 were finished, at least some of them would be on different missions or on refit and such. You're almost never going to have 100% availability of any given ship class. But, hypothetically, if all 18 are available for one unified strike, that's about 50 planes between them. About half as many as a proper fleet carrier, though it does depend on the specific carrier spread between 18 utterly massive submarines that you have to train oversized crews for, in addition to needing pilots who can fly their seaplanes properly. And that's not even getting into the fact that seaplanes are not going to be as effective as regular planes. But let's say they manage to get all the subs done anyway and use them in a mass attack. That is, at best, one half of one wave of the Pearl Harbor attack. So you're really only getting much use out of them for well, terror bombing. Barring hitting something like the locks of the Panama Canal, which was the actual mission chosen for them later in the war. Now, frankly, the entire reason for the existence of these submarines is honestly a reflection of pessimism on the part of the Japanese. We can't hit the continental United States with our proper carriers because of the USN and coastal defenses, so we need a stealthy carrier to do it instead. Logical, maybe, but again, it's 
going to be basically terror bombing because you're never going to get enough of these subs and enough of these planes to, I don't know, hit San Diego like you hit Pearl Harbor. So is it really a good idea to spend ludicrous amounts of money and resources on these submarines? To put it in perspective, each of the I-400s displaces somewhere between five to 6,000 tons submerged, sources vary, which is basically two and a half smaller submarines that are better as actual submarines to boot. Because the I-400s, while they never saw real service, weren't particularly great as submarines, being large and unwieldy, and still a nightmare for the crew. On top of that, they were terrible carriers, carrying only three, admittedly impressive, planes for seaplanes. The Sarens were very good planes, but you can only carry three of them per submarine. It's still an impressive technological achievement, and I'm not going to take that away from the Japanese. But you're really going to have issues in either of their stated roles, as is often the case with hybrid designs like this. See also the ever-popular Battle Carrier. There was actually another class of submarines here, but we'll come back to that later. The third role I mentioned earlier for a submarine aircraft carrier comes to us from France, land of... I'm a do my own thing with my navy. Their cruiser submarine, itself a topic for another video, Sir Koof carried a single scow flow plane in addition to her pair of 8 inch 203mm guns. This was directly intended to operate in the role you'd expect of a seaplane aboard a cruiser or battleship on the surface observation and fire directing. Well, I guess if you insist on having a submarine with ludicrously oversized guns, why not have a plane too? You're already using a lot of tonnage anyway. I suppose it might help make up for carrying only 60 shells for those guns. But no, really. What it comes down to with aircraft carrying submarines is that you're always going to be looking at an inefficient mashup design. Trying for an actual aircraft carrier that happens to submerge is going to result in a wallowing behemoth of a submarine that can only ever carry a handful of planes at best. You gain in stealth, to be sure, provided that your enemy isn't expecting you, since I doubt the subs would be very proficient at evading depth charging. Not to mention the risk of the hangar getting flooded by a lucky hit that might not have sunk a traditional submarine. I would be entirely unsurprised if the Japanese lost some of their submarines this way. And for all that you may gain in stealth attacks, you lose in the overall effectiveness of those attacks. To go back to the I-400s, you're looking at somewhere between 90 and 100,000 tons for all 18 of the submarines. You can't tell me this is a better use of Japan's limited resources compared to, say, six Unryu-class carriers. It's a terror weapon that can only do limited practical damage, a way to strike at a target you couldn't otherwise hit, but not a useful one in most other circumstances. This is, of course, also ignoring how much cost and tonnage you eat in order to carry the facilities to operate three bombers the magazine for their bomb loads, the storage for floats and spare parts, the fuel to even operate them. This is not a small commitment to make, even on something the size of an I-400. I will admit that the Japanese got good use out of their smaller submarines, the older ones that had a small hangar to carry one scout plane. But then again, were those submarines successful because of their scout planes, or were they successful because they were better designed as submarines? Did I-19 sink Wasp and do her other damage because she had a seaplane, or just because she happened to be at the right spot to get a good spread out? I tend to believe it's the second one. Not least because the Japanese would, on many of the surviving submarines, remove the aircraft facilities to add either another gun, or the ability to carry the manned torpedo variant of Kamikaze. This is also why, in spite of some interesting pictures of an S-boat with a hangar welded on top, the Americans or the British or the Germans never really committed to the idea. Because while the small hangar, single plane submarines could get good mileage out of their planes, the fact of the matter is, you could probably get the same kind of use out of a regular submarine. And when radar starts filtering down to subs, carrying a scout plane kind of becomes a luxury they don't really need. The inter-warriors with a sweet spot where a plane on a submarine could be argued as useful for the scouting role. And yet, Japan is still the only nation to really commit to it. Still, I can understand why it's popular in fiction, that's for sure. It's special, unique, and very fun to play against. 
There's nothing quite like the mission in Crimson Skies where you have to sink HMS Barracuda by firing rockets down her hangar while fending off her own fighters. And one can never forget the numerous times Ace Combat throws super subs carrying fighters at you, especially the mimetic missions in Ace Combat 7. Just keep in mind there's a very real reason why, oddball Cold War designs aside, the idea ended with I-400. As we hit the end of the video, I did mention earlier that the Japanese had other carrier submarines. These were the Type AM class, which I've seen in another video described as smaller variants of I-400. This is not accurate as they were an entirely different design, if for a similar role. I bring this up here because the Type AM, or I-13 depending, class submarines will be the topic of Friday's video, providing nothing goes wrong this week. For now, I hope you enjoyed this little video, and I hope to see you in the next one. Remember to like and subscribe, since that feeds the ever-finicky YouTube algorithm.